Welcome to folks who are joining us today uh, for today's training on housing focused problem solving. We are so glad to have you with us. Before I get too far, I want to let you know that closed captioning is available. Uh, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should see an icon with two C's. Uh, if you have any trouble finding it, please do let me know. And we are so glad to have you with us this afternoon. We know how many demands there are on your time and appreciate you joining us for today's training on housing focused problem solving. My name is Monica and I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Joy. And we are here from Homebase, a technical assistance and training provider. We work with housing and homeless service agencies uh, throughout San Mateo County and are very happy to be presenting this training for you today. We're also joined by Matthew at HSA. Matthew, would you like to say hello? Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Hayes, a management analyst with um, HSA's Center on Homelessness. Nice to be here and nice to see everyone. And thanks for joining us, Matthew. Yep. Uh, we can go ahead and go over to the next slide. I'm sure that folks are very familiar with Zoom by now, but just in case some quick housekeeping, uh, we are recording this training so that we can make the recording available to our colleagues who are unable to join us today. We will send out a link to the recording and slides from this presentation uh, later on this week. The breakout rooms and chat will not be recorded. So we do encourage active participation there. Uh, as you entered the training today, you are currently muted, so we ask for you to please stay muted to help us cut down on background noise so that folks can hear the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, tech related or otherwise, we will be pausing throughout the training for any questions, so feel free to message myself or Joy, and we would be happy to assist you. Uh, so to make sure that we can all find the chat and round out our introductions for today, uh, we would love to hear from you in the chat with your name, the organization you are joining us from, and recognizing how very challenging and taxing the work that you do is, we'd like to take a moment to invite you to share an uplifting thing that has happened in the past week, either personally or professionally. And as they start to trickle in, we're so glad to have you with us. Thanks, Joy, for getting us started. And thank you to Tenzila and Casey and Erica. Welcome to Cora. My sister used to volunteer at Cora. That's awesome. They're lucky to have you. Welcome from Life Moves and Abode and Pacifica Resource Center and Mental Health Association. Wonderful. Thank you all so much um, and glad to have you all with us today. Feel free to continue on uh, in the chat. We'll be happy to uh, be similarly lifted by the uplifting things that happened to you in this past week. Um, and as we look ahead to the time that we will be spending together this afternoon on the next slide, this is going to be a skill building training in housing problem solving. Uh, housing problem solving skills such as active listening and conflict resolution are really important to learn and practice no matter where we are in the homeless system of care. 
Um, so our goals for today, we'll start out by um, providing a brief overview of some key foundational topics to understand how they all fit in together with the concepts we'll be discussing today. The bulk of our training will be on building housing problem solving skills and getting to know different housing problem solving approaches. And we will have multiple opportunities to practice those skills and apply our learning uh, here in our training. This is going to be a two hour training. We will have a five minute break around the midpoint. Um, and we do commit to finishing on time. We really wanna be respectful of your time and appreciate, as I said, how many demands there are. Um, I'm sure that your phones and, and emails are gonna be going off during this training, but as much as possible, we invite you to be with us for the next couple of hours to get as much as possible out of the training. Um, and we really do appreciate your time and participation today. So let's go ahead and jump in. So in this first section, we'll provide just a brief overview of guiding principles to make sure we've all got an understanding of some key foundational topics. As I said, today's focus will be on housing problem solving conversations and how to have them. So we'll start on the next slide with housing first, which recognizes uh, that homelessness is a housing problem and all people experiencing homelessness are housing ready. Probably most familiar with this concept as San Mateo County does have a housing first continuum of care. Um, and in housing first with this approach, it removes unnecessary barriers and assumes that supportive services are more effective in addressing folks needs when they are housed and when that daily stress of experiencing homelessness is out of the equation. So as we'll discuss throughout today, housing problem solving can be used at any point in the homeless system of care, including on the next slide to prevent someone from having to experience the crisis of homelessness and having to enter the system of care in the first instance. So in our training today, we're gonna to talk about de-escalating emotion to help us work through crisis resolution. We're gonna keep at the forefront client choice and empowerment so that we can provide the minimum assistance necessary for the shortest time possible to both maximize community resources and making sure that we're connecting the right resources to the right people at the right time. On the next slide, we'll chat about housing problem solving. So this is the focus of our training today. Housing problem solving is a skills-based intervention. And the key is to empower persons facing imminent homelessness to identify safe and appropriate housing options and assist them to return immediately to housing. It's important to note here that housing problem solving is not a barrier to shelter and it is not a denial of service. Housing problem solving is the service and is the intervention. Though there are some circumstances in which connecting to shelter might be the best option that someone has, we first engage in housing problem solving to see if there are options that may be better than shelter for that individual. We do this because we know that even though it may be someone's intention to be in shelter only for a short period of time, we know that many people languish in shelter and studies have found that some of the safety and health risks that folks face while they're living on the street can remain risks in shelter settings. And so we engage in housing problem solving because it uses creative thinking, strengths-based, solutions-focused conversations and active listening skills to identify each individual household's strengths and what resources they might have available to them to connect to those resources to solve the immediate housing crisis. And we're gonna work on further developing those skills today. So finally, housing focused case management extends what we've been talking about to achieve long-term housing stability. For clients who are not currently housed, the primary goal of housing focused case management is to develop a strategy to assist them in securing housing. Once housed, that goal shifts to ensuring that adequate supports are in place and linkages to community resources are made so that the client can stabilize and maintain housing more long-term. And so to put those together on the next slide, Housing First recognizes that everyone is housing ready. 
homelessness prevention prevents homelessness in the first instance or ensures that the episode of homelessness is brief. Housing problem solving, the focus of our uh, training today, uh, focuses on the skills that we need to end that crisis of homelessness. And housing focused case management extends those conversations towards long term stability. There's threw a lot of words at you in a short period of time. So I want to just pause there to see how we're feeling. Um, invite you in the chat to let me know on a scale of one to five how we're doing so far. One being, I'm lost, we need to go back. Five being, I think I've got it, let's move forward. Thanks, Allison and Marina, Catherine and Stephanie. Okay. Thank you all so much. We will try to pause occasionally. I know some folks are taking notes. Um, so feel free to let us know if any questions come up along the way. And with that, I will turn it over to Joy to talk to us about housing problem solving approaches. Awesome, thanks Monica. So yeah, as Monica said, we're gonna be covering some problem solving approaches now, um, having to do with assessing strengths and barriers, creative problem solving, setting goals and making an action plan. Um, so first uh, we're gonna go over the who, when and where of housing problem solving. So housing problem solving skills are important whether you're working in outreach, shelter, case management. Um, and we appreciate folks attending from these different spaces and roles today and having these conversations can definitely be applicable across the system. So first off, uh, housing problem solving conversations do commonly take place at a shelter, rapid rehousing or other sites where someone is accessing the system for the first time. In addition, they may be introduced to this conversation at multiple points in the system repeatedly, um, but simply put, anyone working in the system of care can introduce this topic and have this conversation at any time. It's important to remember that housing problem solving is a conversation and not a transaction. Um, so when having these conversations and interactions, folks should try as much as possible to be in a relaxed and positive environment, um, kind of like a private quiet space where there's minimal to no interruptions, um, no desk or computer between the staff and the household, really just creating um, an open environment to have these discussions. Um, housing focused problem solving is also open and offered to all regardless of um, the perceived needs and barriers. And like I said before, this strategy can be revisited as many times as, as is needed and is continued until the household is safely and permanently housed, um, including in the event that other challenges may arise in the process of finding stable housing. Um, so in sum, this conversation can happen really whenever it needs to. Um, it can be revisited, maybe the first time you try, um, the client isn't comfortable having that conversation quite yet, but you can feel free to, you know, try again, um, pursue it towards different avenues, and it can happen in person, on the phone, um, or a combination of both um, virtual and real-time meetings. Um, we also wanted to recognize that these are really difficult conversations to be having and what's um, best practice might not always be realistically possible. So for example, having a quiet and uninterrupted space might not always be available. Um, folks reasonably may not want to open up about certain things and personal struggles um, right away. Um, so we're curious to know um, just for folks that have uh, addressed this directly, if there are some strategies that you all have tried in real time to practice uh, these housing problem solving conversations, and you can feel free to come off mute and offer some thoughts um, or share them in the chat if you're called to do so. Okay, we'll have more opportunities um, to participate later, so we can definitely um, hold all your good thoughts, um, but we will proceed on. And 
Next, we'll cover um, why use housing problem solving. So housing problem solving is a conversation that's aimed at helping to identify an immediate housing arrangement that's a safe alternative to shelter or sleeping unsheltered, as Monica previously mentioned. Housing problem solving aims to provide solutions that are a good fit at the time with a client-centered focus, and it can help to ensure the following things. Um, so first off, preserving already scarce resources and ensuring that those are better utilized and focus on the most vulnerable folks. And it helps the household that's currently in crisis find positive alternatives. It also can help ensure that episodes of homelessness are brief. So when other living situations become unmanageable, for example, being doubled up with family or friends or other situations, people often resort to shelter. However, um, some may need their own housing or prefer that. And if they believe that they can afford to maintain their own place, they could be offered assistance before um, going into shelter. So staff having these discussions um, could help the client come up with some immediate safe options and further down, um, maybe some long-term solutions to housing as well. Um, problem solving is inherently creative and utilizes out of the box options to identify housing that is safe and affordable. Um, and lastly, um, building that long-term stability through the problem solving process really empowers folks to identify their own strengths and goals and kind of their needs related to housing. Um, so next we'll move into kind of the active engagement section. Um, so we're gonna be looking at how exactly to problem solve. Um, and there's no shortcut tool to this process. The tool itself is really the organic and motivating conversation. Um, and it's just firmly rooted in the belief that households can be supported to find a um, immediate alternative to shelter or homelessness. So the focus here is on techniques of effective and strengths-based communication. And in many cases, just having staff engage in a conversation to get to know the household allows for a successful resolution without accessing shelter. So for example, providing um, different financial assistance types, um, benefits, turning to relationships with family or friends for housing can all be creative um, solutions. Um, that can come from these conversations. And so folks engaging in these conversations can help um, households identify some immediate barriers to housing, come up with creative ideas for dealing with those barriers and exploring realistic options, and really encourage folks to look beyond um, the immediate crisis and consider the big picture and what other things may be possible in that moment. Um, so really having also a strong focus on the household's uh, strengths, autonomy, and ability to choose and create solutions. So on the screen, you'll see kind of a rough um, explanation of how one of these interactions would look like. Um, so introductions, introducing yourself, your name, um, your organization, and the role that you have, and describing the purpose of the conversation, um, and mostly thinking about you know, how we can help folks return to housing. Um, next, active and empathetic listening and strength explorations are also a big part of these conversations and will be explored um, further down in this training. And also having the last step as moving forward. So how do we come to a decision point about what housing options the client may wanna pursue? Um, so to move on to the next slide, um, this following chart outlines kind of the active and empathetic listening skills that are helpful to have um, in terms of preparing to, re preparing to listen, sorry, we can follow the roles acronym that's highlighted on the left side of the screen. Um, so really making sure that your body language is open and encouraging thoughts and discussion from the person you're with, having eye contact, leaning towards the speaker, um, really just allowing for that conversation to flow and um, displaying that you're listening. Um, and moving towards the middle of the chart, focused on active listening, ways we can do this includes um, encouraging language, paraphr paraphrasing or clarifying as needed to kind of relay back um, to the person that you're conversing with that you're listening and hearing um, their experience correctly. 
Also asking open-ended questions are helpful for clients to explain as they would like. Um, and it's not necessarily a time to ask kind of why a client did or decided something which can lead to defensiveness or force justification, justification of situations. Um, so really focusing on the open-ended questions uh, to provide the space for conversation and validation of what the person may be experiencing at the current moment. And lastly, as we move to the right side of the screen, we have empathetic listening, which um, is crucial to building trust and rapport. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, empathy is the intimate comprehension of another person's thoughts and feelings without adding your own judgment or expectations. So really just allowing for the conversation to happen um, and flow naturally apart from any conceived uh, preconceived notions. So, all in all, these skills uh, really encourage rapport, understanding, and trust. Um, it's important, um, this little reminder at the bottom of the screen, to keep this listening step separate from problem solving. As I know, it can be many of our first inclinations to kind of jump straight in and offer solutions. Um, but active and empathetic listening is a crucial stage to offering the solutions that are the best fit possible for the individual situation. Um, also, a lot of words that I just threw at you, I just wanted to check in um, if everyone's feeling okay pacing wise. So please feel free to pop a one in the chat if you're feeling confused and we need to slow down or a five if all is well and you're good to keep going. Okay, seeing a lot of fives. Awesome, thanks everyone. All right, so. Another um, skill that we can build into these conversations is practicing personal and cultural humility. So we want to really just approach these conversations from a place of respect, acknowledging folks' mutual humanity and just having a comfortable and open conversation without judgment. So this really requires us to do the following things, whether it's recognizing similarities, differences and biases, excusing ourselves and others from the unrealistic responsibility of needing to be right all the time, um, and remaining impartial in the sense that um, speaking again to moving away from what you think a person's needs are versus um, more towards opening the conversation and letting them emphasize what's really important to them. Um, also being sincere and genuine, being respectful, uh, asking those open-ended questions. Do not assume because we know that what it would do to you and me. Um, so there's that as well. And also not being afraid to speak directly towards um, cultural differences. Um, so these are ways to just emphasize and practice that uh, per personal and culturally competent communication. And next, um, we are gonna focus on tr conflict transformation. So um, like we said before, these conversations can be really hard um, and it's likely that emotions will come up and create a lot of frustration or anger in which we can use bears. Um, so breathe, empathize, ask, rephrase, and summarize. Um, and also encourage um, you all to use I statements. Um, so stating personal feelings without kind of assigning blame or responsibility or assumptions onto the other person. Um, and so these are just kind of simple ways to um, give necessary breathing room and some time to think as well in order to combat those feelings of getting overwhelmed or frustration that can occur. And I'm seeing Jennifer's question in the chat. Will we be able to get a copy of what was presented? Um, yes, so we can definitely send a follow-up email um, with these materials attached. Um, okay. So moving forward, um, we're gonna go into our first sort of active listening activity for the day. Um, so next we'll be pairing you up in breakout rooms for six minutes. And the purpose of this is to have each person think for a moment about something that's on your mind, whether it's a decision you need to make, a problem or an issue that you're trying to figure out. And the purpose here is to just have someone listen to you 
not necessarily to give advice, but to help you feel clearer, gain some insight, or help you think through or be more confident about your situation. Um, so for this activity, you'll alternate um, between speaking about this issue and being the listener in pairs. You'll have three minutes each and we'll send a reminder to the breakouts of when to switch roles. Um, and so listeners, uh, when you're going through this activity, um, we ask that you, don't, you try not to answer um, questions or offer opinions or give advice, but instead please practice the active listening techniques we've covered previously. Um, so using your body language to show that you're actively listening, paraphrasing and summering um, and things like that. And we'll also have time to come back in the big group and do a debrief of how folks felt after this activity to kind of um, crowdsource a little bit and share um, how folks felt. So uh, Monica, do we have breakout rooms ready? Yeah, okay. So um, we'll send you into your breakouts and please feel free to ask questions if you need help, um, but otherwise uh, please enjoy. Great, and just wanna check in to see if anybody has any questions before we send you out into the rooms. Okay, great. We will send you out in just a moment. So you should see an invitation to join a room. Uh, Joy, I'm going to assign you to, or are you able to join room seven? Or you know what, room eight, never mind. Stay where you're, stay here, you're good. I'm just re making sure that there's people in each room. Thanks, Monica. I always mute myself and then I forget to come back to mute. Um, okay, so I hope everyone had a good discussion in your breakouts. Um, and now we're just kind of interested in doing a little debrief right now. So we're interested to know how did it go? Um, how was it to talk without interruption? And how was it to listen and like not be able to give opinions or advice? Um, so please feel free to come off of mute and um, offer any ideas, or you can put those in the chat as well. Okay. Any other, like, any feedback? How did that feel? Was it a useful activity? 
Oh, I see Joyce raising her hand. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, so today I spoke with Catherine and um, Catherine, and she is such a delight to speak with. I feel like she listened to me. She she wasn't judging my situation, and she was very supportive. She asked me like open ended questions, and she just like listened to me. Like I could feel that she was trying to relate to me and she found something that um kind of like she can relate with because I told her like in my culture this is this blah 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 and she was like actually I can understand that because I'm also Filipino so she found a way to connect with me and just it just made me feel like oh my gosh like thank goodness she understands what I'm trying to say so it was very refreshing to talk to Catherine and yeah I'm happy that I've met her thank you awesome thanks Joyce also seeing some comments in the chat um Stephanie said it was great um, Christine it said it provided a safe place and felt trusting and sincere as a listener, it took practice not to want or offer advice or give the suggestion. Yep, I totally understand that one. Um, and Jennifer says, it was different to just sit and not give any advice or input, but it was a good exercise. Great. I'm glad it felt um, productive for folks. Did anyone else have any um, thoughts or ideas to share? I got to, we're going to speak out sometimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks everyone um, for your thoughts and your participation. And next, I'll turn it back over to Monica. Great. Thanks, Joy. Um, so to round us out in the first half of this training, we're going to talk uh, a bit more about additional housing problem solving skills that we're going to need for these conversations. So building on the active listening exercise, we'll turn now to a conflict resolution. And it is important to remember, and there's a reason we start with the active listening exercise, including the challenge, and it's a big challenge for me, of listening without speaking as well. Um, so as we move towards looking ahead to conflict resolution, we really want to keep in mind that we're helping the client to do the rest of this process and we're not doing it for them. Um, so as Joyce laid out for us, we want to create a supportive environment and this helps us to shift from crisis thinking of fight, flight, or freeze into a more calm setting. So where we can engage in more creative thinking and problem solving. Um, and so that's where we see steps one and two that Joy has already taken us through. We want to keep in mind while we're listening that we want to help the client to articulate their needs instead of assuming what they might be. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more in the next couple of slides about helping the client to identify their strengths and successes and resources that they have used in the past so that we can then help them identify which, if any, of those strengths, successes, and resources could possibly help them to address this current episode of homelessness. And as we're helping our clients to set short and long-term goals, we want to build in flexibility to respond to progress and changes. If we've learned nothing else from the past nearly two years now, the best laid plans might not go as we had originally intended. So best to be uh, clear about that upfront so that when changes need to occur, it's not shocking to the system um, and we don't panic. We, we knew that this would happen. And so now we're starting to engage with plan B or plan C. And so to dig in a little more on this approach, uh, on the next slide, we'll start our conversation about assessment of strengths and barriers. Every conversation that we have related to housing problem solving is gonna be tailored to each individual client, but there are some general topics that we're gonna to wanna to cover with everyone. So first, 
again, homelessness being a housing issue, we're going to want to talk about housing with everyone who we talk to. Uh, we'll be interested to know, it, has the client lived anywhere where it has worked well for them? Um, and what about that situation made it work, work well for them? We would want to know if the client has ever had a lease before, and if so, how that went, whether they've got any past evictions. Again, thinking ahead to if we're going to be helping someone to apply for housing, is anything going to pop up in their housing history that we're going to want to know about in advance so that we can be upfront about it and address some of those issues. Uh, as we're exploring potential uh, resources for the client to ask if they have ever lived in subsidized housing before, um, or if they and what sorts of things they've already tried. Uh, when they're speaking with us, they may have already tried a bunch of things already. So we want to get a sense of what they've been trying and how it's been going. Have they tried applying for a new lease recently? Um, and if so, what was the outcome? And then finally, as we're exploring potential next steps for the client, we want to know if any of the proposed paths that we might uh, propose for them would bring up any concerns for them. Do they have any concerns about moving into their own place? Do they have any concerns about shared housing with family or friends uh, to get a better idea of which paths might be better for them in this moment? Another topic that we're definitely gonna to wanna to cover with everyone because housing does unfortunately cost a good amount of money is to get an idea of the client's current income and financial situation. We wanna know if the client is currently working or if they're able to work. Uh, also zooming out on all potential sources of income. So not just employment, but also public benefits or spousal or child support. Um, and to get a sense also if the client is uh, able to work and interested in pursuing employment to get an idea of whether they have worked before and if so, how that went. So in addition to housing history and income, a couple more topics we're gonna to wanna to touch on that are on the next slide. So we also always want to know what each individual client's preferences are. What type of housing arrangement would they like to have? And we might need to separate that from what kind of housing arrangement would they like to have now from what kind of a situation they would like to have for housing in the future or in the longer term. Those might be the same, but they might be different. Um, we want to get an idea also of geography and where the client would like to live and what, if anything, is contributing to that. Do they want to be close to family and friends, close to church, close to their work or their school, close to their children's schools? Um, things like that. Are there any particular areas where their support network is that they want to be close to? And on the other side of that coin, are there any areas where they want to avoid? If they've had a bad experience, experience with domestic violence or substance use or bad relationships where they don't want to enter into that part of the community and they want to try to avoid that. So getting an idea of their preferences um, on either side of that spectrum. And then finally, uh, as we work towards exploring strengths and barriers, we're working to empower the client so that they can help take this to the next level. And we can be really creative in this strength and barrier exploration. It doesn't have to be related to housing. When is any time that the client has helped or supported someone else? Did they pitch in and do some babysitting recently? Um, have they ever been recognized at work or at school? Uh, have they been recognized otherwise in the community? Just, you know, they had a friend who was going through a rough time and they provided a supportive ear. Any time that they have been of help or support to other people is really great to remind them of because we're really trying to bring this back from um, a feeling of helplessness, which is very understandable in this moment, to help uh, transition over to a feeling of empowerment. I do have a lot of strengths. I do bring a lot to the table and I can identify resources and supports to take this to the next step and get through this situation. We wanna think also what kinds of supports have been helpful to the client in the past and what kinds of supports will the client need to move into and maintain stable housing? 
no person is an island. We all need help sometimes. And so we want to find out what kinds of supports and resources will be best for this particular client. As we're exploring strengths and barriers, it's good to keep a distinction. The strengths that we're talking about are inherent to the individual and the barriers are external. Um, so the barriers not being any individual failure or moral uh, inability, the strengths are inherent to them, but the barriers are external and those that they have been facing. And so we do want to get an idea of what kinds of circumstances or external barriers led to the client's current housing crisis so that we can get an idea of how they might be mitigated or resolved. Was it a personal conflict with someone who they used to live with? Uh, was it an inability to pay the rent that led to an eviction? Uh, we wanna get an idea of what are the barriers that they're currently facing so that we can help them to work through those. And so on the next slide, I'm sure that you all have seen a number of barriers before. We're gonna do a couple of brainstorming exercises here together as a group, because when we're in housing problem solving conversations, it requires us to do a lot of really quick brainstorming and thinking. So we wanna to try to build out um, our brainstorming in advance as a group. So I'd invite you in the chat to share what are some common barriers to housing? that you've seen in your clients or in your work or that you just think of off the top of your head. And I'll warn you in advance that I'm very comfortable with the awkward silences. Okay, we've got some coming in. Yeah, lack of income, mental health, certainly lack of documentation. Credit, absolutely. High rents, yes. Criminal background, no rental history. Absolutely, these are all really common. Losing family or loved ones, definitely. Yeah, let's go ahead and round these out on the slide. This is a great brainstorm um, and folks are really bringing up some really common barriers. Um, being unhoused for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes gaps in employment or housing history, um, sometimes having a larger family and needing um, multiple bedrooms can be difficult. Um, limited English proficiency or, or experience navigating these really complex systems. Yes, thank you, Joyce. Disability, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, and so let's round this out on the next slide with some potential solutions to some common housing barriers. Uh, so here we've laid out just a couple, uh, many of the ones that you've identified in the chat of some housing barriers that folks might face. We know that uh, every conversation we have, of course, is gonna be tailored to the individual, but to get us started with some foundational ideas for some potential resources that might be able to respond to some common barriers to housing. So to take the first one, if the barrier to housing is some sort of interpersonal conflict with someone who was previously providing housing, be it a landlord or a friend or family uh, who maybe somebody was staying with or rooming with. If it's an interpersonal conflict, some potential resources might be to connect them with mediation or conflict resolution uh, to build back up that relationship. It might also be zooming out and checking in to see if there are other supportive family or friends uh, who the person could connect with instead. Uh, certainly pending or previous evictions are a huge barrier to housing. In that case, we definitely want to make sure we've got tenant legal services available on speed dial. We know that unlawful detainers and evictions can happen really quickly, sometimes within three days. And so if we ever find out that someone has a pending eviction, we definitely want to connect them with legal services right away. Um, 
someone in the chat uh, great mentioned that having a history with the criminal legal system can certainly be a barrier to housing. And so for this one, um, as with many, we're gonna wanna get a, an idea of what we're dealing with here. We might need to get some external documentation to sort of round out the story to make sure that we understand uh, what all is in this person's history that they're facing that is causing a barrier. Um, because folks might not know the full extent of what is in their record. So we're gonna wanna obtain that. Also, um, and this can be uncomfortable for folks to talk about that experience, uh, but where we say exploring mitigation and how to discuss it, uh, we want to help clients to get more comfortable with kind of telling their story and this part of their story, uh, explaining it was a rough time when that happened, explaining what they've been doing since then, if there's any more recent uh, connections that they have made with the community, personally, professionally, um, with faith-based organizations or otherwise, uh, maybe they're now in some sort of 12-step program. They have references who can really speak to uh, what they've been doing since that time. That can really be helpful to provide a fuller idea of that story, not just the line on the paper. Um, also, if we can connect folks with expungement processes, that is certainly helpful so that they don't face that mark uh, in the future. Of course, in addition to those, financial history and debt um, can be a huge problem. Somebody noted credit in the chat. Again, here, we're going to want to get some credit reports and get a better, clearer picture of what all is happening. And uh, there are certainly some consumer protection resources that are available through Bay Area Legal Aid and otherwise to uh, clear that debt and communicate the situation more fully to landlords. Because if they are partnering with your organization, that can help to demonstrate further ability to pay moving forward. Um, and then finally, a short-term financial crisis. Uh, so many of us are unfortunately one or two paychecks away or one uh, health uh, trouble or car breaking down or what have you. If there's something that's happening that is a short-term thing, um, or if someone might be able to pay month to month, but they don't have that initial bump that they need first and last, last months and security deposit, we definitely want to encourage exploring if there is any one-time financial assistance that might be available. Uh, or alternatively, if it would help to connect to some mainstream resources or benefits uh, like food stamps or Medi-Cal, anything that can take away or otherwise handle some of the line items on the family's budget so it can free up more cash to go towards housing could certainly be helpful. I want to pause here to see how we're doing. Do folks have any questions? Uh, if so, please let us know. And if you don't have any questions, you can go ahead and put a no in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. So we started out with brainstorming some common barriers to housing. I'd love to shift now into brainstorming some client strengths to resolve a high housing crisis. Um, we'll get you started here. We've mentioned a couple, some positive references, uh, if they've got any work experience or uh, income or employment that's coming in. Uh, are there any additional strengths that could help someone to resolve a housing crisis? Or rather, what are some other strengths that can help to resolve a housing crisis? And these might be strengths that are demonstrated on paper, or they might be interpersonal, like ability to develop a rapport with a landlord or with neighbors, um, having good experience as a tenant. We'll hang out till we get, let's say two in the chat. 
There we go. Maintaining a communicative relationship. Absolutely. And yeah, having an interview with the landlord so that they can get to know them. That's a really great idea. Um, we've got some additional ones in the chat as well to round out this brainstorming uh, on the second half of the slide. And again, we want to think really creatively here. It may be related to housing and it might not be as somebody, as Allison noted in the chat, maintaining a communicative relationship, um, even willingness or motivation to set goals and to work on this plan. Really the fact that they're having this conversation with you is cause for acknowledgement that that is a strength, that they want to have this conversation. So we definitely want to affirm that. Um, and as well as, yeah, that's a great idea to have the client create a portfolio and give it to the landlord to really round out their story and get to know them fully. That's fantastic. Thank you. So on the last slide of this first half of our training, uh, we want to acknowledge that housing problem solving can be really challenging. Uh, we are going to practice this some more in the second half of our training. But to the extent that it can be motivating for us to engage in these tough conversations, we really encourage them because we know that it works. Uh, not out, all outcomes will look the same. Uh, it may be a return to someone's own residence maybe even the one that they were in uh, at the time that you had this conversation. It may mean permanently back with friends or family. Uh, it may mean identifying resources so that entering shelter is no longer necessary. Uh, or as we noted, um, we wanna focus here on client choice. And so as much as possible, helping clients to remain in the community that they're currently in. Um, I'm from San Mateo County and it's a really great place to be. But we want to acknowledge that for some folks, maybe their support systems might be in a different location. Maybe they moved to the county because of a relationship that is no longer part of their life or for a job that is no longer part of their life. And in those uh, specific instances where it might make sense to uh, explore a wider geography, to not take that off the table. But as much as possible, we'd love to keep folks with us. Um, and generally just want to reaffirm that yes, these housing problem solving conversations are really difficult, but they really do work and help people to connect both to end the current crisis of homelessness and to connect to longer term stability. So with that, as promised, we are just about at the halfway mark. So we're gonna go ahead and take that five minute break it is 1.58 right now, so let's plan to come back at 2.03, and we look forward to seeing you for the second half. Thank you. For the next slide, we just wanted to do a brief um, review of concepts uh, before we go any further in the presentation, just as a refresher. Um, so first off, housing problem solving is a skills-based intervention to end the crisis of homelessness. Um, that skill being the conversation, which includes active and empathetic listening, um, some conflict transformation strategies and ways to assess um, a client's strengths and barriers to housing. And finally, that housing problem solving is something that can be done at any point repeatedly for any reason. Um, so really something to just keep in your tool pocket um, throughout your interactions with the client. Um, and something that can be um, repeatedly utilized. Um, so on the next slide, we'll be setting you up for a, a practical application activity to connect um, kind of with the content that we've explored thus far today. And uh, we also have an example scenario um, of a housing problem co solving conversation. Um, so you'll see the scenario on the slide where Alex has a young child, Chris, and has been living in an apartment for the past two years. Chris's other parent, Bo, had been living with them and paying most of the rent, but Bo and Alex had a falling out and Bo left about six months ago. Since then, Alex has missed multiple rent payments. After missing the third payment in a row, property management issued a 10-day notice to pay or quit. 
Alex has moved out of the apartment to avoid eviction and is now living with Chris in their car and has contacted your agency for help. Some additional information in context is that Alex has a high school diploma and works part-time at a fast food restaurant. Um, and also that Alex and Bo are not in contact and Bo is not contributing su uh, child support. So that additional information is kind of Alex's extra context, which uh, the staff person would be asking questions and practicing active listening to draw um, this information out through the conversation. Um, so on the next slide, we'll be playing you all a recording of what this conversation could potentially look like. Um, and I'll leave it to Monica to start the recording. Okay. So hi there, my name is Joy and I work with ABC Program. One of the things I do is to meet with folks when they come in to see if there's anything that I can do right now to help. I try to help people identify some different supports that they might have, uh, such as support from family and friends or other resources that I know about in the area that may be helpful to you. I'd like to hear more about what you're experiencing right now um, and what I could support you with. So would you mind starting by telling me Kind of what caused you to seek out the assistance today? Um, sure. Yeah. Hi, Joy. Thanks. Um, my name is Alex, and uh, I am here because it's been a tough past several months um, for me and my son. Um, it's just been a really challenging time. I lost my my relationship with my partner kind of uh, deteriorated and um so i haven't without their help i i wasn't able to hang on to our apartment for me and and for chris my son oh uh, yeah definitely hearing that it's been you know a particularly rough time for you can you tell me a little bit more about the situation uh yeah so I mean, we used to live in an apartment. Uh, mm -hmm. Me and Chris used to live with Bo, my ex, um, but me and Bo had this big falling out and he left about six months ago um, and Bo was paying most of the rent. Uh, so when Bo left, I couldn't make up his uh, difference. And so I was falling behind and I missed some rent payments. Um, and I tried to talk it out with my landlord to let them know like what's going on. It's a hard time for the family, um, but they weren't as understanding. So they gave me this 10 day notice to pay my rent back or to uh, vacate because I missed three payments in a row. Um, and so when I got that notice, I didn't want an eviction on my record. So uh, me and Chris moved out. And so now we're living in our car um yeah i mean it's just been really stressful and i feel like i'm barely holding it together so i don't know what else to do and i'm i'm hoping you can help me yeah that sounds like a challenging situation to be in for sure um i'm also wanting to know a bit more about your relationship with bo now just if you're willing to share to get a little bit more context of the situation I mean, there's really not much of a relationship at all at this point. Like we're not, we're not speaking. We haven't talked since the last fight that we had. And that was already like uh, several months ago. Um, so yeah, we haven't been in touch and uh, he also hasn't been uh, contributing financially since he left. So like not for housing, but then also not even like for child support for Chris or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Uh, thanks for sharing that with me. Uh, really helps me to kind of understand more of what you're going through right now. Um, and I'm definitely hearing that it's been hard for you in all aspects, especially in trying to, you know, care for Chris. Um, are you currently working or are you able to work at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I do work part time uh, for this fast food restaurant. And like it's better than nothing, but they're not giving me enough hours to provide for me and Chris just on my own. Um, 
but it's this balance, right? Because Chris has asthma and has to go to see a doctor for treatments twice a week. And so I can't go full, full time um, because I have to get him to his appointments, but the amount of hours that I'm getting isn't enough for us to be able to move uh, back into like our own place. Mm, I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds rough. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it sucks. I can't, I hate that I can't do it all for him. Um, and I know that he's feeling the stress of not having Bo around and living in our car. And so I'm trying to like maintain as much stability for him as possible, but it's really like, yeah, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can understand, you know, that all of these challenges are a lot to manage, especially with the recent changes that have happened kind of all at once. Um, but the, in terms of housing specifically, is there a living arrangement that you would prefer to be in right now? I mean, yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd love to be able to get back into an apartment with me and Chris. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, do you have family or friends that live close by, by chance? Um, I mean, my mom and my sister move the they live like a couple towns over, but I have, I don't have a good relationship with my sister, um, but like she really loves Chris. And so when Chris is there, then we all get on pretty well. Um, so yeah, I mean, we could visit her, I guess. She does have a spare room. Uh, we'd need to share it though, but like she's been trying to rent it out anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great that you'd have some family supports in the area that you could potentially turn to. Um, and it sounds like the situation could work well for your needs as they are right now. Do you foresee any kind of potential issues or challenges if you were to move back in with them? I mean, I'm not sure how I'd get to work. Um, my sister shares a car with my mom and, and they also use public transport. Um, so of course we've got the car and Chris's appointments are really close to where they live. So I could easily get them to those, but like, it would be farther away from my job. And so I don't know if I have extra money, like gas is really expensive right now. So mm -hmm. I don't know that I'd be able to get myself around if I need to, and I can't, I can't let go of this job. Yeah. I see. Um, I'm definitely hearing that you have this option to go live with your mom and your sister. Uh, but this move would cause more stress in terms of figuring out how to get to work and maintain employment. Our program can support you with transportation vouchers to get to work. And there's also some mediation and conflict resolution supports uh, that we have that might be helpful in navigating your relationship with your sister. Uh, we can also connect you to uh, food stamps and health insurance benefits to see if there's anything more that uh, could potentially help you care for Chris. Does that kind of sound like some good options there? I mean, yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot that could work. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, uh, I guess, a something we would have to do next would be to to talk to them like my my sister mm -hmm. and my mom um and to see if they would be okay with us uh being in that room that they have uh and then yeah the initial benefits that's an idea uh so if if that works then i'd want to kind of look into other options for employment too just thinking more long term because like the job i have now is is fine but like i said it's not ideal especially if uh bo's not coming back so me and chris need to figure something out that's gonna work mm -hmm. yeah uh sure we would definitely be able to support you in that search do you have any like previous educational history or things that you're interested in career-wise? I mean, I have a high school diploma, that's it. But like, I definitely wanna get some more information on any job opportunities that you have that might help, um, but just maybe not something quite full-time though, like I said, because Chris has his appointments. 
definitely understanding that um, there is quite a bit of time that goes into caring for Chris. So we can take it step by step. Uh, first, we can see what your family says and I'll get you the signups and referrals uh, to access the benefits that we've identified so far. And I'll, you can always reach out to me, uh, give me a call, text. I'll be following up with you also in the next couple days. And like I said, please don't hesitate to reach out if you think of anything else that could be helpful to you right now. Okay, that sounds good, thanks. So you're the person then that I call if I have questions? Yes, definitely. You can feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Alex. Thanks. All right, so for the housing problem solving activity that you all will do, we want to we want you to imagine that um, you've already had that recording as the first housing problem solving conversation with Alex and are now revisiting the conversation to follow up. Um, so some things to keep in mind is that some things may have changed since the first time you talked and, for example, uh, since last time, Alex is still having disputes with their sister and wanting to find other ways to supplement rent at their mother's house. Um, so this is just an example scenario to guide you, but we also encourage you to explore different scenarios if you would like to. Um, so for example, Alex may have found another job or um, their partner Bo may have re-entered the picture. Um, so just when you're role playing, um, whether you're using this guiding example or you're creating your own, um, we ask you to keep um, the following questions in mind. So how would you approach this second housing problem solving conversation? What other questions might you ask Alex to explore solutions to their current housing crisis? And how might you encourage Alex to celebrate their strengths and address um, any barriers that are involved? And in addition, uh, before we send you all to your breakouts, we'd like to quickly just brainstorm the following questions with you all. Um, so kind of what other questions you might Alex, you might ask Alex, um, where would you start and what avenues you would want to explore with them? Um, so I'll go ahead and pop those in the chat. And if anyone has um, ideas or thoughts, uh, please feel free to come off mute or um, respond in the chat as well. Thanks for coming, Christine. We want to see if we can get one or two folks to offer some ideas, things they're thinking about before we go into breakouts. Okay, yeah. Sylvia says, does Alex have a close friend she can rely on? That would definitely be a good um, activity or avenue to explore. Any other ideas, thoughts on these questions? Okay, thanks, um, Sylvia, for offering that brilliant idea in the chat. Um, and here's kind of how we'll break you out into groups for the role play activity. Um, oh, yeah, Monica, maybe even an open ended question how has it been going um, to reopen that conversation up again, for sure. Okay, 
Thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, like I was saying, we'll break you out into groups for this role play activity. Um, so it'll be for 10 minutes. Um, thanks for coming, Catherine. It'll be for 10 minutes. Uh, there will be four people, three to four people per each group. Um, one person will be playing the role of Alex. One person will be the staff person. Um, one person will be the observer or group recorder. Um, so just write down some key points from your discussion to present and discuss with the larger group. Um, and some groups may have an additional person who can float or back up the staff person and the recorder. Um, and folks in the observer and group recorder role will be the ones that we'll be turning to for report outs once we debrief together in the large group. Um, so go ahead and paste roles into the chat. And the activity as well. Okay, so, and just as a heads up, um, we will be popping into breakouts just to see how everything's going um, or if folks have any questions on the activity. But if you see us come in um, and you're already talking amongst yourselves, please feel free to carry on. Um, and Monica, do we have the breakouts ready? Awesome, okay. Um, and we'll go ahead and send you to your breakouts. Okay. All right, so um, it looks like you all were having some very good conversations um, as we were popping in and out. And now we'd like to just do a little bit of a debrief with you all. So we have a few sets of questions. Um, so first off, just generally, how did that go? Um, what strengths did you identify and what other barriers did you all talk about? Um, so you can feel free to come off mute or plug these in the chat. Oh, go ahead, Joyce. All right. So I was grouped with Marika and Luz, and we talked about the situation that we watched in the video. And we, like, first of all, it was really good because we came out with a lot of scenarios. Um, we were very, like, everybody was interactive and kind of um, giving their input. Um, I think my team is solid. <laughs> it's really great. And um, so for the strengths, we identified that mom um, is very much willing to work and that she is trying to actively find a solution to their problems. And she, it, it sounds to me like she's a very caring and strong mom who is very concerned about her child's well-being and she's very focused on what she needs to do. So, um, for the barriers, um, we've identified the child care as one of the strong um, barriers for her to get um, an employment, like um, to have more income so they can start renting again. So you want me to go on? <laughs> so, those are the things that we've identified. Awesome, thanks for offering that, Joyce. Um, anyone in any of the other groups think of something different or focus on some other strengths or barriers? In our group, um, she had um, talked about um, making cooking dinner for the whole family and, and everybody getting on the same page to where like she was helping in the household. So it was like, you know, as a family coming together to so it could be more of a calm um, home for Chris. So um, I like that part to where she was saying that she could cook dinner and everybody could sit down as a family 
I mean, because it was more about, you know, it being a safe environment for Chris. Definitely using the kind of family time and cooking meals to supplement those relationships could be a way to address it as well. Okay. Oh, Marina. Um, it might not be, you know, we, we as case, the three of us as case managers, I think um, we talk about how important it is to unpack and help the client figure it out what it would be best for her. And then maybe have some resources and suggestions, but um, we feel that by working with the client and just creating that space with that client is gonna be able to express her or his needs. Um, they will figure it out what will be best for them. So it was maybe off well, what you asked, but you know, it was great to, it's, it's always great for me to hear other case managers, the way that they approach clients. Because, um, you know, if you give that space to the client, they will come up with solutions. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know, um, Marina, you mentioned, you know, focusing on the resources that can come out of the conversation. And so our second round of questions um, has to do with exactly that. So kind of what resources did you identify that could help solve Alex's housing crisis? Um, and are those resources available in your community? Um, and if not, how might you try to obtain them? So uh, I just wanna share as a core service agency and Pacifica, we, we have, we tried to come up with ideas or ways that it is gonna help the client's situation. For example, you know, there is, oh, I know that there's a long waiting list in, in, in child care coordinated council, but we do suggest that maybe the family needs to add the inform their, their name to the waiting list, or um, we do have some funding available that, that in the past when that is a barrier and, the, and we identified that they will solve their clients um, crisis or situation or their house. And if that's gonna save their housing, maybe we can, we pay for a month or two so they can get back to a full-time work if that's, that's what uh, the client needs. Or obviously if there's, we just, so it's just listening, attentive listening skills and try to figure it out. What is gonna be like, what services are gonna fit for these clients. And here we do, we, we do um, try to be creative in any way possible. We even come up with, if a client um, needs, maybe they need to pay a little bit of rent to the parents. And so we say, okay, you're gonna, we can offer um, groceries every week along with a gift card. So they can bring that to the family until they get back on track. So we do, we try to come up with solutions uh, uh, depending on the situation because every situation is unique. So yeah, we, but we pretty much, we listen what's the situation and then from them we go. Awesome, definitely hearing kind of that individualistic tailoring to kind of what the client's saying in the conversation using the active listening that we've covered thus far. Um, so all great, brilliant strategies. Um, Anyone else have any kind of input on this resources questions? Okay, Joyce, see your hand raised. Uh, yeah, we've discussed about um, maximizing all the benefits that a client can qualify for um, by listening to her situation. Um, she mentioned something about her child going to uh, appointments every week. So we assume the child has some disability or some medical need that can be, you know, that can qualify for a lot of services. 
like example, like um, going through the regional center and getting respite services, um, getting SSI, getting IHSS. So it opens up a ton more services that the family can tap into and that would help them financially be more stable. And um, also use, utilizing all the, the services from core agencies, from food pantries and um, all that stuff um, can help the family really be more stable. Um, also, we talked about um, tapping into like um, other programs like hip housing, um, moving to work programs, um, also like cow work through a, like tapping into cow works and abode and maybe getting hooked up with rapid rehousing um, that can also help the family. Yeah, certainly good to identify all those resources across the different um, sectors. Um, also potentially exploring, you know, more about Chris and how um, we could better help his situation as well and the whole family as a whole. Um, any other thoughts, maybe one or two thoughts more on these couple of questions? Okay, and then we have one last final question on this slide for you all. So how, if at all, was this conversation different than what you already do? So any sort of like differences, similarities um, that you can identify? Or how might you approach it differently? Right, Marina saying it's similar to the conversations we already have. All right, well, if you do think of any other ideas, um, you can please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but I hope the, the conversations were rich and helpful for you all. And um, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to Monica um, for some longer term strategies. Great, thanks Joy. And thank you all for your participation in this very active training. We really appreciate it. Um, so to bring us home now and extend the work that we've been doing to build our housing problem solving skills and practice them together. We wanna to take just a couple of moments here to talk about supporting longer term housing stability. And this is where housing problem solving bridges into housing focused case management. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can look further ahead for these ongoing conversations that we're having with our clients. So the key to this process is goal setting and action planning. We're already going to have identified some initial goals in the housing problem solving conversations, but that might have resulted in an initial sort of quick fix to resolve the immediate crisis. And so hopefully now that that immediate crisis has been resolved, we can now look ahead to something that's more sustainable long term. This may look very similar or very different to the interim solutions that we've identified at the outset. But either way, it's important to have a plan so that we can provide a roadmap for the rest of the work that we're gonna be doing between client and case manager as we further develop that relationship. Similar to uh, housing problem solving conversation, we wanna keep an eye out on roles 
and staying in our lanes. As much as possible, we want the client to be leading that process and establishing their own goals. And then as staff, we can engage in those active listening and conflict resolution skills. We can also share some information about available options and how to prepare to achieve those goals to kind of fill in some of those gaps and help to break those steps down. Because we want these action steps and to be clear and easy to understand. We want to know what the next steps are so that we can work towards achieving them. We wanna get an idea of how long they might take to achieve, you know, things like bureaucracy, if you need to get identification or go through social security. It's good to be upfront with someone in advance about how long that process is gonna take because there's a lot that can be happening while you're waiting for that to go through. Um, we want these goals to be measurable so that we can stay motivated and see the progress that we're making. Um, and as much as possible, it helps to break these goals down into a concrete period of time. So for example, say someone's goal, long-term goal is to get a job. There's a lot to happen uh, in those, right? We wanna create a resume if we don't already have one. We want to research some jobs. So maybe we could say this week, I'm going to identify three jobs that I wanna apply for. And next week I'm gonna apply for one of them. And then the week after I'm gonna apply for another one. And then maybe the next week I've gotten a call back. So I'm going to prepare for an interview and do a mock interview. Lots of different goals here uh, so that we can see that progress and keep up that motivation for our longer term goal of achieving employment. Um, and we also want to be chatting about what kinds of support and resources we could be utilizing for each step uh, with those goals. Who might be able to look over the resume and provide some feedback on it? Who might be able to help you with that job search? who might be able to sit down with you to have that mock interview. And so to further outline some potential short-term and long-term goals here, um, as we noted, some goals that tend to be on the longer side, uh, often because they just take longer, uh, things like achieving employment, maybe furthering one's education to get a GD, GED or English language courses, um, maybe seeking treatment, treatment for uh, mental health or physical health, or applying for disability or other kinds of benefits. These things do take a good chunk of time. And so there are some short-term goals that we can add to round out our roadmap. Things like researching housing listings daily, um, or increasing hours in current employment, or connecting with a legal service provider to resolve some urgent legal issues or help us with the record expungement or maybe uh, resolving a pending eviction like we were discussing earlier in the training. And as we're helping clients to brainstorm supports that may be available as they work towards their goals, we want to uh, consider potential challenges that may arise so that we can troubleshoot in advance. Again, things don't always go exactly according to plan, but if we can identify potential roadblocks, like maybe if we have to call such and such office, we're gonna be on hold for an hour and a half. And just knowing that at the outset helps us to mitigate our expectations so that if and when something does happen um, or if something doesn't pull, pull through, we saw that coming in advance so that it's not um, as concerning as if it had come to us as a surprise. We also wanna be looking at uh, resources that might be available both in terms of financial resources and interpersonal resources and supports. Um, if someone is looking to have their own lease, we wanna set them up for success in that lease providing some tenant education and supports to ensure that they understand their lease and the most important lease components and that they are in compliance with that. So that way they do get that lease, they're able to hang on to it. Linking folks with community-based social supports, if it's childcare, a senior center, um, maybe an identity-based community or a faith community uh, to help folks to really connect with the community. Um, and connecting with enrolling in benefits 
and maximizing their housing budget. If we're able to take some of those everyday expenses, some that you were thinking about um, in the activity like groceries or gift cards, if there's anything that we can take out of the budget and help them handle so that we can maximize the amount of budget that goes towards housing. So now I uh, want to thank you so much for your participation and give it back to Joy to take us home. Great. Thanks, Monica. So yeah, just to kind of close out in these next few slides, um, here are some reflective kind of next steps or food for thought questions when thinking about um, your staff's housing problem solving strategies and ways to further reflect on how these can benefit your community. So first of all, what actions can you take to use housing focused problem solving with clients now? Um, what actions can you take to secure additional resources for housing focused problem solving in your community? What additional training could housing focused problem solving staff use? And how will you measure and also celebrate you and your client success? Um, so many of these, uh, I think, have already been touched on throughout um, our opportunities um, for engagement and participation in these training. And these are just some um, final thoughts that we'd like for you to take with you um, as you think about housing focused problem solving in the future. Um, so next slide. I think we just want to know if anyone has any final questions or comments for us today. Lingering thoughts. Okay, Marina, you can go ahead. Just, um, just a suggestion, maybe a comment. Um, if we all have a clear understanding of uh, the programs available in San Mateo County for all case, case managers, it will, be, it will be very helpful so we can be clear um, and transparent when we providing resources to the community. Uh, sometimes we don't know if we don't really, mm -hmm. even myself, it's always great to hear this will happen when I refer you to this, this place. And this is gonna be available for you. So um, just having maybe more information, more trainings, it will help all of us case managers to be updated on the resources available for each client. Absolutely. Thank you so much for raising that. And uh, that's why we're so glad to have HSA on all of our trainings with us. So we will definitely uh, follow up with HSA offline so that we can provide some follow-up resources. Thank you for raising that. Awesome. Thanks, Marina. Does anyone um, else have any other questions? All right, um, I think we can move to the next slide. So finally, we just like to leave you with a few resources for um, housing focused problem solving that we've used when compiling this training. So first off, we have a rapid rehousing toolkit from NAEH that's really helpful. Um, an example of a housing stability plan from King County, Washington. So kind of seeing how um, another community has uh, pursued this as well. And um, to close out using the NAEH um, homelessness prevention guide. Um, so these are just a few um, resources you can turn to if you'd like any more information. Um, and yes, and Monica says, uh, we'll include these links in slides and a follow-up email as well. Um, okay, so I think with that, we can move to the next slide. So we just wanna say big thank you so much for your participation today. Um, we hope that it was enjoyable for you as it was for us. And we'd like to capture any feedback that you have um, on this training through a survey link that we'll pop, we popped in the chat. Um, and alternatively, we also welcome uh, follow-up questions or feedback to our team email, San Mateo at homebasedcc.org. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for attending this training um, and giving us your time and attention today. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day.